All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us for the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts program. Our presenter this evening uh, is Grizel um, from the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts. Uh, there'll probably some, be some time for Q&A. So if you'd like to write down your questions um, and then, or you can put them in the chat if you'd like, and then we will um, uh, proceed with answering those questions at the end of the event. Grizel, welcome to the Parsippany Library and please feel free. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Like um, uh, Jean Marie said, um, um, my name is Grizel Casasola and I work in that beautiful building that you have there on your screen, the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts, which is uh, in Madison, New Jersey. I actually work in the annex, <laughs> which is across the street uh, from that building, but I do go back and forward to the museum. I've been working there for three years and such a beautiful ride. Actually, 20, 2020 was more, more working from home, but but yeah, you get you get the you get the idea. It's a beautiful building. And when we have guests coming over or when we do the uh, in-person programs, and I always tell them, just take a look at the at the building. What does it look to you? So if you want to write there in the in the chat, I'm not gonna say, but if you write it there, uh, what do you think the, the building actually looks to you? What do you think the building was meant to be? Um, if you know what it what it was, then don't say it, don't spoil it. But we're gonna talk a little bit about that at the end for sure. And I'm very happy to be working with my with our Shipani Library. Um, I actually got my library card from there. <laughs> I moved to, we moved to Virginia around almost two years ago. I live like five minutes from the, from the library. So hopefully we can get to, to do a program in person soon. Ready, that will be very, very cool. All right, so today we're gonna be talking about re something really fun. But before I'm gonna show you, this is actually um, something that I have here for you. It's a picture of what the museum used to be before. And this is a very old picture. And this is what it looks right now. This is the main gallery. Um, the, that, that exhibit is no longer there. That main gallery exhibit always changes like probably like at least twice a year over the year um, around spring and then again around winter time. So yeah, but that's how it looks right now. Right now it's actually under construction. It's um, getting a very well and much neater uplifted in the paintings around the around the wall so it's gonna look even more prettier this is the library art all of those are the university and college um fields and and the information from different colleges we have art bar in there we have princeton university we have a few and today we're going to be talking about a program that is really really dear to my heart um my expression, I am a teacher, so I used to be a teacher in Puerto Rico. I, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. And since I moved here to New Jersey, I've been working in different different schools, different and um, public schools and also um, private schools. And then three years ago, I became part of the museum, which is awesome because I can teach our history and I, I can keep teaching and, and talk about education and history. My passion, amazing. So a look at the 19th century education and school. So this is the beginning, the genesis of what we have now as the education system and the, the schools here in New Jersey, both private and the public school system. This engraving is from Alexander Anderson and this is courtesy of the New York Public Library. So this is an ideal um, you know, you have the, the, the work school in there <laughs> and you have in there also the building, the, the small building and, the, and the, the big building and you have the wagon and you have, that is like an Ethiopia, <laughs> not every not every time it was like that. Yeah, not every town or not every school was like that, but we're gonna get to learn today. Now, in the 19th century, witnesses the actual century, um, a dramatic shift in education and schools across the whole country, not only in New Jersey. By 1828, a New Jersey State Survey found a 
And take a look at this. That one in five voters, one in five voters, okay, people who went to the polls and voted, couldn't read or write. So it's something like that, that as simple as that, that you go and you vote for someone, but you don't know how to read and write. And that at that time, there was no electricity, so there was no TV. And not everyone had a radio. I don't really know if they were able, radios at that time, or even they became later. So how do you know who are you voting for if you don't know how to read and write? Now, the public schools in New Jersey developed between 1828 and 1875. So 1828, that's going to be almost 200 years ago. In 1875, the Constitutional Amendment requires free public school for all students between the ages of 5 and 18. 1875. Now, I'm happy about that because I know many countries today in 2021 that they don't even have to, to be in a school. So many countries, they don't even have school, uh, school system and others, they do have the school system, but they don't actually have a law for the young ones to go to school. They go if they want, or they go if, if they care to go. So in here, the fact that 1875, everything, you know, began to form and everything has, you know, people really wanted to, for education to have uh, an opportunity and to be free and, and available for everyone, that was good. That was def definitely a good track. Now take a look at some of the schoolhouses. The one in the right that you have in here, I know many people have to be familiar with this one because this one is closed. It's right here in, in Morris County. It's here in Florham Park. I passed, I actually passed through that one um, today because I went to the museum around to the, I don't know the name of the street, but I went down there. So that one is a pretty one. And if you take a look at that one, that one is big definitely big. The other one, the one that is here in Mount Holly, not everyone knows that one. And this one is definitely a lot older and it's really cool that it's still standing in there. It's from 1759. The oldest primary school still standing here in New Jersey. Isn't that amazing? I love it. I love the fact that you still have the date in there, but look how tiny it is. So, it just trying to imagine, I was talking with, with uh, Jean Marie a few minutes ago and just trying to imagine right now, everyone in school trying to go through this, this new school year in the middle of the pandemic. Imagine just going through this pandemic right now with schools this tiny or places this tiny with no, no virtual whatsoever. It was a mess, it was really far. So the fact that it was actually a place that they would call schoolhouses. And why schoolhouses and not only schools? Well, basically because if you're going to be in school all day and not in your house, then you are like in, in the house of the school. So a schoolhouse, they put it together because you're going to be there the whole day. But you look at the contrast between these two. So one is 100 years older than the other one. But the fact that this one is really standing there, it's never stopped so amazing. Hopefully they 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 taking good care of that one. Now, the school year, you have to understand that the school year around that era, you know, 200 years ago was completely different than what we have today. New Jersey was a very, very, very farming, uh, uh, proactive and farming important. Farming was important part of New Jersey. So New Jersey was a state that it had so many farms. There are so many places right now that when you go and you take a look, what? what well, this place will look like 200 years ago. Oh, this was a farm, all right? Um, so children were a vital part of the farm's labor force. So take a, uh, uh, just a moment here and, and, and think about this. Children were not playing the whole year. Children didn't have that recreation moment that we have today for our children that, for example, summer. Children today, they have two months of summer where they don't have to do basically anything after they, 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 they end their school year. That didn't exist 200 years ago because they were part of the labor force. So as long as they were strong and they were around five, after four or five, six year old, and they were strong, they, will going to, they were going to be in the field working with their parents 
doing whatever they were they were capable of doing. Now the school year is shaped by the need to have children working on the farm in the fall and spring and the busiest time on the farm. So those two um, uh, seasons, they were the busiest time on the farm, right? So in the farm for fall and spring, and then in the school for summer and winter, because basically you're not doing anything in the... Uh-oh. Griselle, you're frozen. And I did this program a few weeks ago with, in, a, um, in an adult center. Um, and I, I, I was, you know, showing them the well and, and, and talking about the fact that even 200 years later, schools, they still have the bell. Oh, the ring the bell, ring the bell to change from one, from one class to the other. So they used to call the children in from outside and to get their children's attention is still going. So the idea stood, the, the idea was so, so good that it, it keeps on going after 200 years. So we do have a few. This is one of um, from the collection. We have plenty of bells and they are really, really loud and really strong. Yeah, like really heavy. <laughs> now, this is a, an example of how a, a schoolhouse uh, will be in the, in the interior very different from what we have today so we have today we have chairs personal chairs or we do have um tables that um sometimes uh, two students can be or four students can be in a table but this is what it will look like 200 years ago so you will have um those look like stools in there and or pews and then one two three four maybe children per per seat probably if they were a little bit more like not that thin then three, but if they were like skinny, skinny children, then it would be like four children in there. And uh, we lost one picture that we had that it was actually many people, many children in there, all scrap in there. And I was like, how on earth did you learn like that? Like, it's like, how do you can concentrate in a place like that? And in the center right there, in the center of the, of the classroom, what do we have in there? We do have stove or something to put the fire in there because remember we're going to be in school in summer and in during the winter so for the winter we were going to need the fire and we were also will need the um the fire just because if we wanted to actually use make the use out of something we need the fire probably it's not going to be there the fire lit all day long but we will need the fire for something so it was some, it, that was the the, the, <laughs> the heating system of the of the 1800s. And this is another um, example. This one is a little bit more like it is shaped and organized in the form of more of like a uh, regular or more um, modern schoolhouse or schoolhouse interior. Just look at the blackboards in there. That one is a very big. Or, and then for, for the for the fire, that one is massive, right there in the middle. And if you take a look on top of the actual um, seat, those look more, more like a desk, and you will see in there something that we're going to be talking about in just a few, because then you will need to use that actually to, to write what the teacher was saying. So this is very interesting. Now, another example of the interior is you will have the teacher in there. And this was mainly, and this goes way back a little bit more. So this was like a classroom for reading and performing, talking about poetry and the declamation about poetry and everything. So this was more like a different, in a different way. And you will see that in the left side, you see the boys and then in the right side, you see the girls. This goes like a, from the, 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 the artist mind, of course, the, the point of view of the artist who did the engraving. Again, in here, you see that now something that is very um, unique as both in this picture and on this one, you see that teachers are men. Now, that was not exactly the case always here in the year. You see, the mo most of the time, the, the, the teachers were women. And it has to be um, 
clear that they were younger women because either from after they were 16 to them to the moment they get married so um i have to say this it's not not i don't agree with it but <laughs> this is just what it was 200 years ago uh at the moment uh, if you were single okay and uh, from 15 17 or 20 or whatever you you were allowed whatever age you were allowed to fish as soon as you get married then you are not allowed to work anymore because all of the finances and everything belongs to the to the husband to the to the man of the house so you were not allowed to work for an actual different person that doing something to get paid you were not allowed to do it if you were a woman right so then eventually another teacher will have to come. So that is a, that is a very interesting fact. Um, definitely just a little bit of history for you. So you can learn a little bit more if you didn't know it. Uh, in here, we also have in also the seating and then the desk. So that was coming to change. Um, eventually we, we evolved, evolved to what we have now that we have the personal shares or we do have um, tables that look more, um, are more, um, comfortable and more makes sense I really more um, um you know designed for the school the school room the, the classroom that we have now now the actual lessons all right were focused on two different things first of all you need to learn how to read all right so that is the B you cannot possibly go in or go to learn other subjects or classes if you don't know how to read. Remember, one in five voters went to the polls after 18 years old, they went to vote and they didn't know how to read or write. So when schools became a thing, first thing we're gonna do is reading, right? Now, in here to our left, we have something that we have plenty of those in the museum. If I were there with you right now, and I will be giving you what, what, what I'm showing you. And it's called a horn book, probably from the early to the mid 19th century. Now, what is a horn book? That is a very good question. Now, a horn book, it will basically be like, a, all right, it's a, it's a piece of wood, all right, just like it, it's in there. It's a piece of wood like that with a hanger in there. And in the actual horn book, teachers will actually put the letters of the ABC. So that's why it was so important that the letters were, were clear because that was the first step. Learn to your ABC from A to Z, right? Sometimes they would actually put like a picture of an animal with the same letter. So if you will have the A, then you will have an animal or some kind of fruit. So you will have the A and you will have apple. You will have the B and you will have a bird, right? So that way people can start to relate. Oh, okay, so this word and this letter goes with this, with this um, animal or with this um, fruit, food or anything like that. Now, why is it called horn book? So today we have everything laminated. So if I show you on my library card, if I show you anything, a book or something, it is laminated. But back then they didn't have. So what they basically did is just, they wrote down the, the ABC and they designed everything and they put it on top of the of the piece of wood, which is what is what the, the horn book. And then after an animal died, um, it, will, it could be um, a bull, uh, it could be like a deer with the, you know, with the horns, any animal they will have the horns, then they will collect the horns and they will actually put the horns on and on something, either a bucket or something, and they will um, pour some, some kind of mix between water and then the sticky, the sticky residue that the horns were actually, you know, dripping and dripping mixed with the water they will take and collect that mixture and they put it on top of the paper where they actually wrote um, the ABC. And then they would leave it in there, they would put something really heavy on top of it to cover it. And after a few days, that would dry and it's com it was completely dominated. So the brains and the minds 
and the innovation of people, it was just simply amazing. Yeah. Really, really, really amazing. Never stop to amazing me. And that's what I call a horn book. Basically, it was a book, or it was like a, like sh showing you the ABC, but the horn had to be there because the horn of the animals was used were used to that. Then eventually, after the ABC, after you know your letters, we will go to the book. All right. This is one of the um, um, samples from the New England Primer um, edition. So in here we have 1777. Hey, that was right in the middle of the American Revolution, 1777. All right. So this was just the first, first one of the first editions. Now. Remember, the books were going to be based and, and we're going to have a lot of history and a lot of information from England. You know, the country was still, was in the middle of the war trying to become free from England, right? There were people saying that, oh, we need to stay, you know, um, um, loyal to, to, the, <laughs> to the monarchy or whatever. And there were other people saying, no, 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 we are already a country, we need to keep growing and growing. So the education was like, yeah, no one, no one was really interested in education. But yeah, that's wrong because yes, there were people interested in education. So books definitely became um, an important part of the house of the school houses, but there were so so just a few. Uh, they didn't have the, the many resources to actually have plenty of books. So this was one of the first ones. Then eventually, this one was like the eclectic reader. Now the word eclectic says it all, right? They will read anything that they were able to read. After you 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 know how to read, you will read anything in here. A collective series. So a little bit of poetry, a little bit of stories to tell, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. The point that the, the important thing is, is that when you were practicing your reading skills. That was the important part. Then we go a little bit more. Look, take a look at this one. Farmer's school book, focusing in the farming because New Jersey was such a big, um, important part of the New Jersey history was farming. So we actually have one of our permanent activities in the museum. Um, and I know Ms. Jean Marie was there a few months ago. So she saw the farming, working the land. We have a, a, such a big um, exhibit about farming because it was really, really important. Now we have spelling book for the use of school houses here in the United States. Really, really important. These emerged in the mid 19th century. Now, after you know how to read, after you master those skills, you know, between this book and the other book and then the other book, now we're going to write. So you graduated from the core book and the ABC, you move to the reading, you, you are familiar with the books. Now we go to the to writing on slate. Now, what was a slate? I wish, I really wish, this is one of the programs that I love to do in person because I can show you that you, can, you get to really touch and to experience ah, an example, an idea of why they experienced 200 years ago, but you're gonna see it in picture. So, Writing on the slate, it wasn't like the slate of like this this picture in here that is showing you. It's, I, he's actually showing you like a like a board, you know, in there. No, 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 no. Not even the slate with the board in, in, in with the frame in wood. No, 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 no. It was actually a slate, a piece of rock that it was like that, slant completely the slate. And they will use that, the first one, the very first one will use that. And they will use another piece of slate that it was really, really just pointy and they will try to write. Now, this was way before the 19th, the 19th century, right? This, this was 1794, 18, at the beginning of the 1800s. Because again, it was just coming out of the American War, American Revolution. You know, you didn't have many resources. And school was just in diapers. The education and everything was just in the beginning and in the process of waking and everything. So after they were doing the slate, 
and, and, and write it with that. Eventually, they graduated from the actual slave, the, the, the pieces of rock, and they moved to the slave board, which are made out of slaves, but they did have more like the, the, um, the look of a, of a, of a shock, shock board, but it was still slave. And they will use something more looking of like a pencil, but it was still slate. We do have in our museum, we have slates for you to show you, and we do have the slate pencil. That's why I, I would love to, for me to be doing this in person because you're really going to love. I love those to show you how hard and how difficult everything was at the, at the beginning. Now, from that, we move forward to what we know and we still use now. Cup, I mean, let me just take a look at here one of mine. I have one here, one uh, pen, and this pen inside, it does have the ink. I'm not using ink uh, um, quill, I'm not using the ink right, the ink right like ink well, I'm not using ink, like wet ink, but it still has ink. So this is the, the final product of writing with ink. So after you're done with the slate, you go with the ink. And the ink stood there for years and years and years. It was really, really big. Now, ink began with the quill. Take a look at that one in there, in the picture. We have three different, you know, we have the quill. Quills were used way before the dip pen and mainly from the from the geese but also from turkey no bald eagle we have so many younger kids saying oh that's the quill from the from the eagles no not from the eagles was mainly used here in the US from the geese from a goose or from turkeys we have plenty 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 so many wild turkeys here in new jersey so at the end i'm gonna tell you where the ink actually came from but for well, right now that moving from the slate writing with ink now i'm going to show you now writing in copy book now what is the point of doing the copy book here we have uh an, an example a picture of one of the copy books that we have from really a long long time ago this one is from 18 18 17 18 19 or 18 17 it's really really old but we we cannot show or use the original one we do have the original one but we show you the picture now it's the same and the same and the same sentence going a hundred times now writing in a copy book that was practicing your writing first we were practicing with books our reading and now we were going to be practicing in writing with copy books so you will write the same sentence many, many times for you to actually practice. And not in, in print, you will write in script or cursive. The way that we say in Puerto Rico is cursive, but in here it's actually in a script, I know too. So nothing like in print that we have today, no, it was script. This is another example. Virtue is charming, virtue is charming. Temperance and exercise are guardians of health. Imagine writing that a hundred times. Imagine going for days and days and days to school just to practice, actually practice your writing skills. That was that was really important. Yeah, this one is from 1870, 17. So this is over 200 years ago. And it's amazing that we still have it. And it's very important. That this was the case for for all the, the, the students and all the children to actually learn and practice your writing. Now you finally graduate. You go from the horn book, the ABC, then you go to read, then you go to write. Now you know how to read and write and how to write. Perfect. Now you need to learn numbers. Because if you don't know how to read and write, then how on earth are you going <laughs> to learn the rest of it? So now that you know, now we go to arithmetic, which is just a, you know, a fancy word for math. And then we will have different, many, many books. By this time, they will have different books 
show, showing um, the most important part of the of the math. So it was basically subtraction and adding and the multiplication table. So it was really, really cool that they took like something like right now today, you don't learn math the same way that they did it. You learn it in a different way. So the fact that reading was so important for you to actually learn everything else back then, I mean, we still have that, but students don't get to really see the multiplicate the, the tables of multiplication until second or, or third grade. So back then they were actually learning this when you when they were really, really young. And this is one of the books they will use. Nine times eleven are ninety-nine. This bunch of grains grew on my bank. So even though you're learning about, about numbers and math, you are still practicing your reading and your writing because you will be reading this so many times a day until you learn your, your adding, your subtraction, your multiplication. So that's why you need it, definitely need it to read, to learn how to read and write. This is by 1841. Now, why am I saying the younger kids will, will, will know how to do this, will know math at, at a young age? Because there were no different, there were no grades back then. There was only one classroom and all the grades were together. So a boy, a little boy, a five, six, seven year old was actually learning the same as a 14 year old in the same classroom. Because there were no different sessions and no different uh, classrooms and no, 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 it was only one with all the kids from the community or from the town, all right? So we, we have to keep that in mind. Now, and this was definitely the Marmaduke Multiplier. This was, we do have uh, new editions in, in the museum, but this was the most famous one and the most used one to teach math in, in school around those years. Now, the school has utilities. Oh boy, that, that I show, <laughs> it's so funny. Remember, I'm from Puerto Rico, so um, we have something called, not, it's not this, it's something called, it's, it's different in Spanish, where we actually um, like dig a hole um, close to the, to where your house, and you do, it's like a bunker house or something. You dig a hole, and then you have like that piece of hole covered with something in there, and that will actually protect you from a hurricane. Remember, I'm from the Caribbean, I'm from Puerto Rico, we get a lot of hurricanes. So back then, when when a hurricane was coming or something, the house was made out of wood, so the house was not safe. So they would go in that into that space to actually, you know, pass the hurricane in there. So when I showed this picture to one of my family members, um, she told me like. Is that what I think I am? And then, no, no, no. This is not a, a, a school, um, a hurricane um, bunker. This is something different. This is where you go when you need to actually go, um, you know, to the restroom. So this was the outhouse, and this one is still standing in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. All right. So it's very interesting. And here you see all the utilities that they will use 200 years ago. So, like we talked in the beginning, this on the on your right in there. This is the actual um, the stove or the or the wood, you know, um, the oven to put um, your your wood in there. That was the, the the thirst for everything during the winter that would keep you warm. That would <clears throat> that would also keep your water warm. So remember, you will have to go outside. You will have to get the water probably from a well or from a stream. All right. In those early, early years before wells, you will have to go from a street. So if you were out there in the winter, <laughs> it's just a miracle if you can actually find running water. And if you do, that that water was freezing. So you will need to put it in that bucket and you will need to put it inside. And if you need water for anything, then you actually have to warm, right? And then if you do need to go um, and do your basic needs as a human, then you will have to go out and use the outhouse. Now, was that funny to go out in, in, in freezing temperature, uh, below zero temperature? No, it's not, but I assume that kids were completely familiar with that because that was actually almost the same as the, if they were in their houses. So 
keep that in mind the next time that you're complaining about something right now because we have absolutely everything to our <laughs> to our power anything that we want now we just have it in the power of a switch right there cool and kids and teachers and people 200 years ago they were not that good okay they have to fight for absolutely everything now the teacher take a look at this picture right here because it's very interesting um when i moved here to new jersey one of the first things that i did is that i have to transfer all my documents and everything in my my teacher license from puerto rico to here and i never thought about when did this start i never thought about okay so when did the teacher certification begin and anything so it really amazed me that in 1862 this is a certification so it says certified that try to read the name try to write in the chat what the name of the of the of the person is i said it's kate we were our debut our division we're always debating on what the actual name is either kate and then uh, one of my co-workers says it's hartson and i say it's like hartson you know but that's the name in there but certified that kate blah 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 Constitute held at Delhi in October 6, 1862 by the School of Delaware as required by law and by consent. And it keeps on going and going that she will be the teacher. And this is, um, you know, affected out of 18 date of October 1862. So yeah, so the 18th of October of 1862. She was licensed and she could work in the school um, the term of three years from this day. And then she would probably have to re renew that one. So how cool is this? You know, the way, way, way back then, you know, 100, I don't know, many years, that she will need the actual certification just like we do, we need today. So pretty awesome. Now, not everything was, you know, um, in, in, the school, in the actual school, not everything was about <laughs> um, studying and, and that was it. The, the, the children, especially during the summer, but also in winter, but during the summer, they will uh, uh, enjoy a little bit of, you know, the recess and lunch, also lunch time. So this is an, an engraving, again, by Alexander Anderson. A few toys and games from a school day, you know, a school week, in, in the schoolhouse. So in here, we have one of my favorites, okay? In there, there are three different boys that are playing and you have the circle and you have the little ball so over there. So yes, they are playing marble, with marble. Now, I grew up playing with marbles in, in, in my hometown in Puerto Rico and I used to carry that heavy bag because I used to win a lot. So I was carrying <laughs> my, my, you know, my book bag and then my, my smaller um, marbles bag, it was it was three times heavier than my book bag, and it was like cut, cut, cut. And I was like, yeah, that that would mean that means that only means that you win and you win a lot. And yes, I was very, very proud, proud of that. And when I started working in the museum and I saw the marbles and I saw that we have so many different programs talking about marbles, I I told to my former boss and I told her, this is amazing. You're bringing all every possible memory back in me, and now I'm gonna get out and get more marbles because I want to play with my husband or something because I, I used to love it. Definitely, I used to love it. Before, actually, we go to the school stories, they would also play with something really cool that it was like, a, I want you to, to think about a hula hoop. So they would play with the, the, the actual circle and it was just like a stick and they would throw it and, and I saw when, when we were doing the research for this program that that was a very, very, actually very common in, um, in, in like popular game. Um, during the winter time, they would do the slides uh, around uh, the school, you know, from a hill, something like that. They would also use the, the, the a seesaw. It was just like a plain piece of, the, you know, wood, like two by two over a fence or something, not safe at all, but they will, they will have a lot of fun. So yeah, eventually they will game, they will play games, and they will go to recess, and then they will come back to school. Now, 
it's very important to know to know to that eventually when schools began to to be formal and everything the recess you know in schools it, they are still there because it's important for for the young ones for the children to have just a few minutes to recharge to walk around you know that is that is important for every human being it doesn't matter the age just walk around you know have something to eat in between all those so many classes and then go back again and just after you drink and you you recharge and you replenish your brain and then you can go again ahead also many another important factor is that back then it was only reading writing and in and, and math but eventually with when all the classes and subjects became something that you will have five or different six different subjects during the day you need the concentration and the actual brain of a, of a person to be completely completely alert so the most heavy most most like for those those subjects that you need to be like really really fast learning you will actually learn those in the in the morning so anything from reading for math and science in the morning and sadly they leave my history or my social studies to the end either they are in the afternoon or something and then that's why that's why everyone just fell asleep in history i'm like i was the only one i remember being the only one awake when i was taking my <laughs> fucking his, such a um a study classes in Puerto Rico and everyone was and I say why why is everyone asleep and the teacher was like oh because you know history is, is boring the history is not boring it's, <laughs> it's the way you're teaching it I was I would start you know in a conflict with the teacher you need to do this or you need to do that I've been loving history since, since I was as long as I can remember but yeah that definitely math and and reading and 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 science that was always that's always been in the in the morning in the the beginning of of the day now very cool cool story now i want you to hear you because i've been talking you know for almost an hour here <laughs> and i'm going to try to see your faces in here see how many people we have in here and please please share a comment or ask a question and please share your school stories. I was, like I said, in an adult center a few weeks ago, and I was working with very, very beautiful people. Many of them were full retired teachers. I had only two gentlemen, and the, the rest were old ladies. And one of the, the, the gentlemen, he was from Brooklyn, and he said that everything he cared about is that he had his ink, like ink well, on the actual um seat and he will have to write 200 uh, sentences and he was like that like that and that uh, that was the whole thing he he spent the whole the whole program talking about that but i don't hate that your story you share your story so please share your stories and, and have fun here at the, the get very very end of the program i think that marianne has a question well, yeah, I just in your first uh, slide, one of your first slides, Griselle, you, you mentioned uh, the Constitution. Was that the New Jersey Constitution or the U.S. Constitution? Giving Let everybody. Go. Let me go right here. It was the first one you say the first. Yeah, right here. Okay, so. The Constitutional Amendment. Was that a New Jersey Constitutional Amendment or the United States? Um. I want to make sure I want to have to double check because it's, I don't have it right yet, but I think it's okay. a constitutional amendment because it goes requires free public school for all students. So I think it was it was around the country. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. Um, the other thing I'd like to share with everyone, which is kind of important, is that we have at the Persephone Library, if you are a Persephone Library card holder, we have the museum passes for the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts. Yeah. So you could actually go and see all of this stuff in person and you could meet Grizel. And um, so that's something that I wanted to make sure everyone was aware was aware of. Um, yeah. I did have I a question. Bring, I was gonna bring one of the slates for you, but one of them is really, really heavy. And I was like, oh wait, I, I was so late on it. I'm so sorry, but 
If you <laughs> if you ever come to the museum, if we ever do another program, I'm gonna try to actually either bring it or bring you a picture of it. Do you know the? Uh, this is just a question. Do you know? Is there like a? I, I don't know what you would call it. A comprehensive list of all of these schoolhouses in New Jersey. Is there like a list somewhere that? It, 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 they have, um, we do have information about that um, um, because my former um, boss, um, this was a question that we, we do get uh, at, um, in schools when we do this with kids. So definitely, definitely there is information about that. And, and if you want to, I can email you that when I, when I double check that. Because I, okay. I already have your email. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. When, when, when Grizel uh, emails me, um, then I will um, um, send everyone a copy of that list via yes. the via mm -hmm. your emails. Aida yes. says, "I offer I'm no stories." <laughs> uh, Aida says, "Thank you. I offer no stories." The first schoolroom image shows. Hold on one second. Uh, shows seats that seem very narrow. How could a child sit there for any period of time on such a seat? Um, you said that women once married were not permitted to work outside the home. Was that a social norm? So yes, sadly, all, sadly, <laughs> sadly, yes, for both of those questions, how can a child sit for, for so long in such a, you know, um, uncomfortable, uncomfortable chair seat? Yeah, for sure. Um, but that was the reality. Yeah, definitely. Especially if the schoolhouse was really small, that was definitely the reality. And also, yes, women, for some period of time. You know, remember, I don't know if you know this, we have a program about, uh, it's called um, Time for Time of Change. Um, everyone talks about, you know, the 19 amendment and everyone, and everyone talk about the amendment and everyone talk about women actually were able to vote. But no one talks about the fact that women were fighting for this years and years and years and years ago. So definitely, this was one of the fights that they had. Women here in New Jersey were not allowed to, to keep working for someone else and get paid after you get married. So it was a social norm, and it was just it was just the way it was. Is there any question about the other machines who are being suited? <laughs> um, uh, we don't have exactly like the, like the indication from them, but we definitely have the indication from when we do work with students and we tell them how it was 200 years ago. So sometimes I like to ask them, would you be able to live in the 19th, in the 19th century for 12 hours, for 24 hours? And they say, no more than 24 hours. I cannot live without running water. I cannot live without my iPad. I cannot live without this and this and that. So yeah, definitely that's an indication of what we have now that yes, it was hard. It was definitely hard. Definitely and, hard. And yes, that, that's, that's only for us to be more appreciative. We have to appreciate and value what we have because what we have now is so so much different than of what we used to have, yeah. <laughs> And then she asks, how do you read uh, slate powder one, one a sheet? Slate, wait, how do you read slate powder once a sheet of slate? Um, yeah, I, that, I, think, I think that's too fancy the way, the way you're saying it. Yeah, because it was like, <laughs> it was almost impossible to actually read because you were actually taking a piece of rock and writing on another piece of rock and just try, try to, to, to go over the day with 30 students, all of the students do it, making this sound. Yeah. How do you go? Yeah, yeah. Worst try sound that. ever. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's terrible. Yeah, the powder, yeah, the powder. The powder is just, not only the powder, but the, the noise and everything. So yeah, it was definitely, yeah, yeah. definitely hard. Yes. Yes. So when they sure. when they ev eventually graduated from the slate to the ink right, whoa, that was you know that was the innovation. That was the technology of the century. Yeah. Do you sure. do you think that they that they didn't let them practice in the beginning with the ink because it was just too expensive and too valuable? Like the ink was not expensive at all. The ink that they will use because the ink came from nature. The one that they actually used. 
Oh. The one that it became more uh, expensive and everything, it was when, when it became um like um um you know um it was selling, it was actually selling by manufacturer. No, they would actually use first of all, they would use like walnuts, crushed walnuts, and they will burn those and they will mix the anything, you know, the ashes from, from what they burn, and they will mix it with water. And that was ink for them. That was that was yeah. ink. And they would actually use a lot of the three, the three barks, and they would use a very similar process, and they will have ink. It was no, no, no um cost whatsoever. Yeah, those that was the first. Oh. Yeah, that was the first. So it wasn't that yeah. fancy stuff. No, exactly. That when when eventually became popularized and it was actually sold by industries and everything, that's when it became more 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 difficult because you will have to actually buy it yeah got it so there's another question it says i can't remember the name of the game of a hoop and a stick do you know the name of that game the name that we have in 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 our in our museum in the museum is something called the grace i don't know why it's called like that if anyone knows but it's called like that it's basically you have the 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 the, the circle you know the hoop and you have the stick and you will throw it and then the other person has to catch it with it with the stick and it was a very popular game <laughs> you know it was that that was the ipad of uh, of the, of the <laughs> yeah i love it i love it um so does anyone have any other comments or questions that they would like to ask of griselle um otherwise i would like to thank you very much. I thought it was a wonderful program. Um, and if for anyone who's interested, I'm going to look into the time of change program. Maybe we can um, ask um, Museum of Early Trades and Crafts to do that one also. Um, that one, that one is a very, very cool program. I developed that program last year and I fell in love completely. And it's filled with information and it's filled with history. And I will very much love to share it with you. Oh, okay. So I'll send you an email then. Um, let me see now. Hold on one second. Uh, Lindsay says, ah. as a teacher, I cannot imagine having to teach all different grade levels at once. So amazing that teachers in the past times were able to do that. Thank you so much, Chriselle. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm right there with you, Lindsay. That's completely true. <laughs> yeah, we were we were talking about this, Jean Marie, from the beginning. Teacher has had it the, the worst in the beginning. Teachers have the worst of scenarios from the beginning. Now yeah. dealing with the pandemic and two hundred years ago dealing with everything. No, it was it's hard. It's been hard. For, it's for been teachers. very hard. They are yeah. heroes. They are heroes of this of this pandemic. They really stepped up and worked very very hard. So, yay, yes. teachers. Yes. All right, so, all right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I don't know if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask or any comments. Um, yeah, so otherwise, share, share, share your, your school stories. Do you have any school stories, Jan Marie? Uh, <laughs> any good stories? I did, have a, I did have a fifth grade teacher that told me I would never amount to anything. Is that a school story? Isn't that terrible? Oh, man. I mean, clearly, I'm, I'm, I didn't listen to her. Exactly, clearly, I yeah. didn't listen to her. So there you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, actually, I have a very cool story about about school and, and when I was learning to write. My mom was a my mom is a, was a teacher, a retired teacher now, and many of my family members are te are teachers and were teachers. So I learned to read when I was three years old. I, by the time when I was three years old, I was already reading. So. My mom didn't think of the fact that when I, eventually I went to kindergarten, I was bored because I, I knew how to read, right? So what I would do is just like help other students actually learn how to read in kindergarten. And I was also, my grandma didn't know how to read or write. She was, yeah, she never let, get to, to learn. Um, she lived to, to be, she died almost when, almost when she was a hundred years old. So um, I was her, I was her, her, you know her communicator for her yeah, yeah. Her communicator her translator and everything 
and the doctors, I will go with the, with her to the doctor's appointment. And the doctor yes. was like, oh, what is this cute little girl doing? And then my grandma was like, no, no, no. She knows how to read and write. She knows everything. So she she's going to help me. And I was just this tiny, tiny girl, five years old. And I was right there helping my grandma and helping oh. others. So that's, that's really cool. That's very cool. That's very cool. Well, all right. Look at this, ladies and gentlemen. It's 7.57. Um, Again, I welcome you all to come and get the museum pass um, and I'll keep you posted on the, uh, the time of change when that will take place. Um, Grizel, thank you again so very much. And thank so you. I bid you all good night. Thank you. Take care everyone, stay safe. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.